um, trauma is particularly amenable to this particular approach to PowerPoints, which is the iconization of relevant elements of the study. So along the bottom, on every case in this collection, you will see four icons or numbers, right, that denote important aspects of the case. The first is the mechanism of trauma. So something like 75% of these are motor vehicle collisions. So you'll see that green triangle pretty frequently. But every once in a while, you'll see a horse or a gun or a soccer ball or whatnot. Uh, the next number is the expected mortality for that injury. So I take those from the N NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information, which is an aggregation of publications that have been vetted by government officials. And it's a great resource for anybody doing research who wants citations uh, for your presentations and whatnot. Great place to go, the NCBI. So that's the expected mortality. The next icon will be whether that patient lived or died as a result of that acute trauma. And the last one is, did the radiologist accurately report the salient findings? So I give you a big, big red X like Miss Othmar from kindergarten. Uh, if you missed it and there is a green check mark there, if the radiologist accurately uh, identified the findings. All right, so watch for those along the bottom. I, I think that's a pretty handy tool if you're ever watching any of these and you think to yourself, did that guy live? Did the radiologist see that, et cetera? You can just look right down to the bottom of the screen and, and appreciate it. All right, so this is actually, I start with uh, one of my teaching file cases. So all my cases, they're, they break down into about a third, a third, a third. A third of them are cases I saw myself in the course of 30 years of practice. A third of them are ones that I have encountered through medical malpractice or quality assurance programs at VRAD. And about a third of them are ones that were given to me by colleagues. So frequently I'll come out in the morning, everyone knows I'm a case pack rat, and I'll see a string of links you know, that people have sent me over the night. And ultimately what we did is we built a teaching file into our system. So any radiologist can right click, save permanently any examples of cool cases. And then I can go into that and run them down, make the follow-up calls to the facilities, et cetera. So one day I usually reserve that for the first of every month. I'll go in and see what's new. And usually there are about a thousand cases added monthly. But one, uh, one March, I remember it was March 15th, the Ides of March, I had a free hour. And so I went into the teaching file and right at the top was this case. And it said ductus diverticulum comma splenic laceration. And I thought, sounds kind of boring, but maybe I can use it for my aorta lecture. So I went and I looked at it and <laughs> had a moment because that is not a ductus diverticulum. Uh, we will go into that more in detail, but there it is just far too irregular. Now, it is located right at the isthmus where your ligamentum arteriosum attaches, and this is where you will get 80 to 90 percent of your aortic lacerations due to blunt trauma. Uh, but it's also where the ductus diverticulum uh, can live, right? A normal outpouching, broad-based kind of aneurysm at the isthmus region of the aorta. Um, but this is far too irregular. There is the very slightest amount of density around this aorta. You always want to look for a little density in the periaortic mediastinal tissues, and there is this tiny crescent of gray right there, but it's not much. And compared to most aortic lacerations, it's almost nothing at all. So I was really given a moment on this. I said, that is too irregular to be a ductus. It's got to be a laceration. But there's so little stranding, I was doubting myself. But then I went down into the abdomen. And look at that. Well demarcated, subcapsular, wedge-shaped hypodensities in the spleen. It is so important in traumas to spot those and identify them for what they are, which is microembolic phenomena. Okay, you see those in the spleen or in the kidneys, 
you need to go upstream through the vascular system and find a vascular injury. Okay, it could be the splenic artery here or the aorta. In the case of the kidneys, renal artery or aorta. But there is going to be an upstream vascular uh, injury. And that particular appearance, right, is so important that you note subcapsular, wedge shaped, well demarcated hypodensities in the spleen or kidneys. And I, I tell you, I see this missed with some frequency. People will call these non specific hypodensities. And, uh, and fail to attribute to them the significance that they should have. All right, so at that point, I was pretty convinced, and I went and I called, oh, when you go to the sagittals, it's a little more apparent, right? There is clearly an intimal flap on the sagittals, and look at that little pseudoaneurysm in front of it, right there, that little outpouching. It doesn't look as irregular as it did on the axials, but this is a pseudoaneurysm from a laceration. That is not a ductus diverticulum. A ductus diverticulum is a little more anterior on the aortic arch. It's broad-based with obtuse angles to the native aorta, and it is not so vertically oriented as this. Okay, a ductus, if there is any persistent little uh, entity from the ductus arteriosus, it will be more horizontally oriented, and we will see an example of that. Okay, so here, uh, the first one of the day often doesn't uh, run very quickly. There is the irregular laceration, and now we go down into the abdomen, and you can see there are actually a couple of those little hypodensities in the subcapsular spleen. So note that irregularity, minimal surrounding stranding, and evidence of microembolic injury to the spleen. Okay, and here it is on the sagittal. You can see again that vertically oriented, small, fairly acute angles to the native aorta, and an intimal flap. And here is a PDA to give you comparison. So you see a ductus would be that broader based, a ductus diverticulum would be the broader based dilation there that you see. And if there is that little residual portion of a ductus, it's going to be more horizontally oriented and more forward on the aortic arch because a ductus, divert uh, a, uh, ductus uh, arteriosus attaches to the base of the left main pulmonary artery. So obviously to do that, it has to be more horizontally oriented and it has to be farther anterior on the aortic arch. Look at that little jet of contrast from the arterial pressure aorta into the left PA. And of course, that's going retrograde to the flow of blood in the pulmonary artery. And there it is again on the sagittal. All right, uh, so what did I do on this? I called the facility and said, oh my God, there's an aortic laceration. And they said, well, fortunately, there is a suspicion of a splenic laceration. Obviously, our guy, who, by the way, was a really good radiologist, but everybody has a bad day. He had read that spleen as a possible splenic laceration, attributing to those hypodensities the wrong, uh, the wrong cause. Uh, but because of that, they had kept this patient flat for 12 hours overnight, and I was calling in the morning and the ICU nurse said, we were just about to get her up and walk her around. And I said, God, don't do that. All right. So we get, did a follow-up a week later and they chose to just manage this watching and waiting, which is great because one of my colleagues actually, uh, when I showed him this case, he said, geez, tell him not to kill her trying to fix it, uh, which turns out was good advice that they did take. So they just did nothing, and this was the one-week follow-up. And look how much more well-circumscribed that little diverticulum or pseudoaneurysm is. And look at that. The splenic stuff has resolved completely. And you may have noticed on the earlier uh, images, the acute images, there was no perisplenic fluid whatsoever. And calling a hypodensity in the spleen with no perisplenic fluid, it had better be central and not exiting out the capsule. Uh, but that was a stretch uh, as well as his ductus diverticulum call.
And there it is on the sagittal, a nice, smooth, well-circumscribed little pseudoaneurysm. All right, some more obvious ones. This has a lot of mediastinal density. Look in the prevascular region and in the AP window. Okay, there is too much gray there. There's clear fluid density in the mediastinum, uh, which should call your attention to this pretty obvious laceration of the aorta. See that crescent of extravasated contrast? That is the classic appearance of an aortic laceration. The thing to note about aortic lacerations is if there's anything that puts you at risk for search satisfaction, it is the aortic laceration. Because I start with the aorta in almost all traumas, and when you see an aortic laceration, you know, you break out in a sweat, you move to the front of your chair, you're dialing the phone or at least clicking. Uh, we, we have automated dialers, right? So you just click to make a phone call. Uh, but it, it puts you in a panic state. And so it's easy to fall prey to search satisfaction and not thoroughly evaluate all the other structures that could be injured. And I'll tell you, it's very frequently associated with significant injuries to other structures. If you have enough trauma to tear your aorta, you most likely hurt something else. So here's a good example. You know the other places that you get aortic lacerations are at the aortic root and at the diaphragmatic hiatus. This is with blunt trauma, right? 80 to 90% are isthmus, but then that other 10 to 20% are gonna be aortic root or diaphragmatic hiatus. And here at the diaphragmatic hiatus, we can see there's a small vessel avulsion, and look at that periaortic density. Really tune to that periaortic fat in the retrocural region, um, at the diaphragmatic hiatus, a little wisp there will often be the first thing that catches your eye and calls your attention to an aortic laceration there. This one is over the top. This is really, really dense and quite a lot of it, but uh, tune your eye to spot that kind of thing. There is also too much density in the retroperitoneum here surrounding the great vessels, right in here. See that? And this is actually catchy, uh, tricky on a screenshot because it's this outpouching right there. Uh, this is actually an associated IVC laceration, and you'll be better able to appreciate that on the cine. So there's the aortic laceration. Look for that crescent of contrast beyond the confines of the otherwise perfectly round aorta. And then look at all that periaortic density. There's a little avulsion bleed there. And then watch the IVC here. Oh, you see that medial outpouching? And then it goes away again. All right, so that's a venous pseudoaneurysm due to an IVC laceration. IVC lacerations are very rarely treated surgically. Same with SVC, although the SVCs very rarely even make it to the hospital. Um, the vena, venae cavi are very thin-walled, and when they're lacerated, they become just wet tissue paper, uh, very difficult to fix. So I've noticed over my years that there is a definite high threshold for intervening on isolated venae cavi injuries. All right, our next one, this is a transection. So in the case of transections, you have a transverse tear through the entire aorta, and the torn ends pull apart like this, right? That is usually fatal on the scene. In fact, if you look at the mortality here, we're up to 94% mortality. Um, but the ones that make it are the ones that the aorta does not tear completely through. The adventitia stays intact. And so what you'll get is those two torn ends pull apart, and you'll have an intervening segment there of slight dilation of aortic flow that is just confined by intact adventitia. So again, we have prevascular, that's that region right in front of the aortic arch, right? Uh, prevascular density telling you there's something wrong in the mediastinum. Then we have that crescent of extra luminal contrast that tells you there's a vascular laceration. When we go down to the next cut, there is that intervening dilated segment. That's just bound by adventitia, but it still looks surprisingly smooth, right? And then now, lower down still, 
we're at that other distal retracted end of the torn aorta. All right. This one gets a little bit complex, but I want you to note, first of all, that this is the bottom most, the lower most cut on this study. Look at the left kidney. It has a normal corticomedullary phase arteriogram, right? That is what early arterial imaging of the kidney with contrast should look like. But look at the right kidney. It, it's not actually enhancing, right? You don't see any cortical enhancement. What you do see is arborizing, looks vascular enhancement, but it's clearly not getting to the renal cortex. And what that is, is the appearance of retrograde enhancement of the renal venous system, okay? That is, so there's an absent nephrogram, and yet I see those arborizing vascular structures full of contrast. That's retrograde enhancement of the venous system. And look, there's a whole contiguous column of contrast coming down the IVC, which is giving rise to that. All right, so uh, this is an absent nephrogram, and this is the imaging appearance of a right renal artery avulsion. And so you're not getting arterial supply, so the kidney remains hypodense, but then the backflow of the power-injected contrast is coming down the IVC and coming out the right renal venous system. So that's retrograde enhancement of the right renal venous system. And I have a case later that we will contrast with this. If you didn't see IVC contrast backflowing, then you have a different diagnosis, and that's a right arterial venous fistula. Okay, you can tear the artery and vein right next to each other. The higher pressure arterial blood will flow into the lower pressure venous system and give you that same appearance in the affected kidney. But in that case, you will not see backflow down the IVC, right? So that's how you separate those two. All right, so here is that transection. That's the proximal torn aorta, the intervening segment of dilated pseudoaneurysm, and then the distal aspect of that aortic tear. Now that's suprarenal venous backflow, keep following the IVC, and then that is ultimately giving rise to the retrograde uh, filling of the right renal venous system. I've actually got uh, additional views here. This is one, aortic transections, they make for beautiful 3Ds. So there it is, right? It's one tear, the ends of the aorta have pulled apart, and you've got that intervening segment that represents a pseudoaneurysm bound by adventitia, right? And that 3D really makes it clear what's going on. This guy actually had a thoracic spine CT too, so we have a magnified view. And there that is again. And we've got a sagittal as well. Right now that you know what's happening with those, they're pretty easy to spot.